And Father, that's our heart's cry this morning. Lord, we give you our heart, we give you our soul. Lord, would you have your way in us? Lord, we're your church, we're your bride. Lord, would you do a work in us this morning? Speak to our hearts through your word. Encourage us this morning, Lord, as we remember that you are on the throne, that you are in control. And so, Lord, we're here. We love you. We're trusting you together. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you turn at a distance to your neighbor and say, it is good for you to be here this morning. It is very good for you to be here this morning. Beautiful day in Hawaii. I am going to grab this for... I'm going to have to flow this around. Brother Steve has asked to testify this morning. He has... Pastor Clay come up right behind me. You can have Pastor Clay come up right behind you. Do anything he wants to. <laughs> I gave him... I said, you got a, you got a couple minutes to just share with us what's going on this morning. You don't mind if I take this off for two minutes. Two, you, just turn around so that they can all see you. I will. I'll get this. I am a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle I'm here. I haven't been here for like eight months. What a blessing. It's going to be a blessing if I get it through this without crying. Guess what? You are a miracle too. A miracle. Look around. How many miracles we have here. It's just amazing. Remember that story in the New Testament about Lazarus? What happened to him? He went and died. How, how dead was that? <laughs> totally dead. What happened to him? He's alive. Guess what? I could have died. Yeah. I spent four weeks in four hospitals, severe head injury, split the forehead open, four inch gauge. That was fun. On a 10 scale, the pain was 27. It was unbelievable. Never had that before. I was came to on the floor of one of the offices there at Queens West and I said, hmm, this doesn't feel too good. And everybody's around me saying, Mr. Kirk, Mr. Kirk, are you okay? I said, well, what, do I look okay? There's blood everywhere and I'm splitting headache. And I said, no, I feel really junk, you know. I said, I don't think you need to go home. You need to go to the ER. Well, I didn't surface from the last treatment for four weeks. And they said, you know what, when you're down there, Somebody was with you, and I said, yeah. God was with me. Yeah, amen. My heart rate went through the roof. My blood pressure went in the toilet. I could have easily died. Yeah. No problem at all. Not even get off the ambulance. A miracle of God. Amen. But I also thought of another little illustration from the New Testament. A fellow had been by a, a pool, a neat little pool, but he couldn't get to it because he'd been there every year for years and years and years. He's, yeah probably pretty old and you know he's thinking man I'd really like to go to that pool because it was said if you went to the pool at just the right time once a year and no matter what you have leprosy whatever you had God's going to heal you somehow and I, I think by about you know 10 or 20 years you think well I haven't even been able to get to the pool I'm not going to get well I can't be healed I give up already have you ever felt like giving up if you've been there, you know what that's like. And I felt like giving up too much already. I cannot handle, you know, and God said, yes, you can. Because I'm in you and I'm going to work through you. I'm not done with you yet. By any stretch. And from that last hospital, I rose from the bed. and I was wobbly. I'm still a little wobbly. That's why Clay's up here. Just in case. I don't know if that's that wouldn't glorify God if I fall over. I'm not going to die on you, but I might go down. <laughs> I love you, brother. And I approached Pastor Eli five minutes before the service said, Can I testify for a few minutes? He said, Yeah, you got about two. <laughs> uh, so I'm squashing 20 years of testimony in two minutes, you know. But, Basically, I could have been like that old guy. I'm getting a little bit older. I'm not 27 anymore. I'm turning 69 in a couple of months. And I've been feeling, wow, too old, cannot testify. No more stories to tell. Jesus Christ woke me up at 1 a.m. this morning. He said, this is what he said, get up, you're going to testify. And I'm like, nah, I don't have nothing to testify. So get up anyway. <laughs> he said, well, I guess we can let you up there, you know. 
I got a story to tell. Yeah. If I don't, I'm going to explode, I think. Yeah. There's always hope, doesn't matter what you've been through. Amen. Amen. And there was a hand extended to that fellow that's pretty, I don't know how old, probably older than me by now. And he'd all but given up. Yeah. said, forget it. I'll never be used again. I'll never get healed. Guess what? That hand was put down and yeah. the mouth was open. It said, rise, get up and, and walk. Yeah. He hadn't walked maybe for his whole life. I don't yeah. remember the story, all of it. He walked in obedience, that's all. He yeah. probably didn't even really believe. But he got up and he walked. Amen. I'm going to run the Honolulu Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Joking. <laughs> <laughs> Stay at people are telling me, oh, you better be careful. I can barely walk down to the mailbox and back right now. It'll get better over time. Yeah, I've been told God to be careful. I fell one week four times, and the last one was on the floor of that hospital. But by the grace of God, a guy named Gary came out of the woodwork, and he said, hi, I'm Gary. I said, I know you. He said, I know you too. Your pastor C from a long time ago. I said, you're Gary. He's been an elder at North Shore Fellowship for like four decades. He said, yeah. I think maybe I need to pray for you. I said, you think? <laughs> so he just, in Jesus' name, you'll be healed. And I'm like, yeah, right. He healed me. Here I am today. Maybe you're hurting even right now, and you didn't really want to come service today. Guess what? Jesus is going to heal you today. He healed me, and he can heal you. And, you know, the enemy is going to immediately come to you and say, you're of no use anymore. Your your time is over. But God said, no, it's not over. Yeah. Testify. Yeah. It may be to one person, and you go to that one person to say, I'm not the same. Yeah. Pastor Clegg went in obedience to Washington, D.C. by himself. That's a long journey. Yeah. And I said, you know what? God told me, when you come back, you'll look like the same Pastor Clay, but you'll be different. Yeah. I don't know how, what that's going to look like, but you'll be different. Yeah. And God said, you get up right now, you get in the car. I could barely finish my breakfast. I said, what am I going to say? And he said, I made your mouth talk anyway. Just talk and I'll feel it. <laughs> <laughs> like Moses, I'm slow of speech. Too bad, do it anyway. Yeah. Somebody needs to hear it. Yeah. If you've all but given up hope, there's always hope in our Savior and our Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Amen. That's all I wanted to say. Well, let's pray for you, Brother Steve. Let's pray for this gentleman right here, miracle of the Lord. Father God, I thank you for Brother Steve, Lord. And even though he had those four falls, and even though he was in the hospital for all of those weeks, in the rehab for all of those weeks, Lord, you are raising him up. And Lord, we just trust him to you. I thank you for the passion that he has to share your word with those that are around him, that those who you put in his path, Lord, he is always out sharing, uh, sharing his testimony, Lord, and sharing the good news of the gospel. And so I pray that you would continue that good work that you began in Brother Steve, Lord, that you would complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. So I thank you for our brother. I thank you for him being able to testify to us of your goodness and your greatness. And Lord, I do pray what he shared this morning, that if there's anyone here who's at that place of giving up, of losing hope, that you would encourage us this morning, that you would use your word this morning to encourage us as Brother Steve uh, began this, uh, this time in your word. So Lord, I thank you for our brother. I thank you for my friend. Bless him, Lord. Continue to heal him, Lord. Get him back to 100%. We trust our brother to you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, the name above all names. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to make it on the cord. Thank you, guys. You got it. Cool. Okay. I'll get put this guy right over here. Okay. We are. Oh. We're going to do something a little different this morning. I have a whiteboard. I have a teacher. I have a whiteboard and a teacher here this morning. <laughs> Welcome to the classroom of life. I want you to, I'm going to ask you a question. It's, this is a one word answer, and you, uh, you just shout it out where you are, and, and, and Pastor Clay's, and Lorena, if anybody does it online, you can let Pastor Clay know. Just shout it out where you are, and Pastor Clay's gonna write down our answers here on the board. I want you, as you're sitting here, we, this is the first day of November, guys. This is the 11th month, the first day of November. I want you to think back this year, and I want you to describe in one word, 2020. Describe in one word, and I'm going to call on my, my good brother, because he already shared with me. 
Sean's going to start us out. He's all the way in the back. Sean, you got to yell so we can hear you. One word to describe 2020. Pastor Clay is going to write down. Disappointing. Shout it out. Let Pastor Clay write it down. Challenged. Challenged. It's a challenging year. What else? Come on. Unexpected. Unexpected. Radical. Radical. Who was, what else was back there? Joy. Joy. Hey, we got some joy in the house. <laughs> Blessed. Blessed. Sucks. <laughs> okay, sucks. Confusing. Confusing. Chaotic. Cha chaotic. <laughs> that's not, that's what a vacuum cleaner does, doesn't it? A vacuum cleaner sucks. So <laughs> it can't be terrible. Uh, we had confusing, chaotic. What else? Stressful. Stressful. Anybody else? Pray. Hope. I heard hope. Pray. Praise. We got praise. Pray. 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 We got to pray in 2020. Amen. Anybody else? Agonizing. Agonizing. <laughs> We're describing 2020 in one word. Okay, thank you, Pastor Clay. I think we got, I think that pretty much we've got a good representation of what has gone on this year. And I think we look at this year and we look at the things that have happened this year and we have this tendency to think, man, nobody has had it as hard as we have had it this year. No one has had it as hard as we have had it this year. And we look at the, the economy is going down. There are small businesses. How many small businesses have closed this year? I mean, you just think about the, the things that are going on. We look at this pandemic that has gone across the entire world. We see these radical divisions that are occurring in our nation today. We see, uh, for the first time, I was talking with Brother Phil this morning, for the first time, uh, we have this election that's coming up in two days. And I see there are many people in the United States that instead of having this anticipation for the future, I start to see that they are walking around almost in dread. There's a lot of people in, especially in these communities that have been hard hit by riots. I saw pictures, somebody posted on Facebook, I saw pictures of Los Angeles where there's these mom and pop businesses are taking their businesses, they're taking all their goods out of their store, they're boarding up their stores in anticipation. They don't care who wins the election, they say it doesn't matter who wins because my whole livelihood will be destroyed in riots regardless of who wins. Can you imagine this week, you thinking in your head, it doesn't matter who wins the election on Tuesday. My entire livelihood, everything that I've built with these two hands is going to be destroyed. That's a challenging week. That might be an agonizing or chaotic. It might be some of these words that we have up there. I mean, it absolutely, we see that the love of most, many, and even in our country is just growing cold. Uh, where, what's going on? I, I had been talking with somebody I forget who, maybe it was Jim we were talking, and I told him, you know, it feels like it, it just feels like the only way that this division is going to end is with violence, with some type of civil violence that's going to happen in our country. And then I was, I was on Fox News, and I, I don't look on the news too much anymore, but I was on Fox News, and there was a comedian back in my day when I was growing up, and he's the ultra, he's the most liberal guy that you can absolutely have, um, Bill, Bill Maher? Is that him? He's the most liberal guy. He had a clip on and he said, can we just get to this election and skip the next two months so we can avoid the civil war that's coming upon our country? That's an ultra liberal that was seeing the same thing that I was sitting there talking to Jim about. There's people that are looking at our country and saying there is craziness that's going on. And it's not just in our country. We see craziness going on in the church, the faith, the hope, the love that we're called to have is starting to grow cold. Why? We start to see in the church, we see false teachers are springing up. We see compromise. Be like the world. It's okay. You can be the same. There's compromise that's sneaking into the church and it's drawing people away from an authentic faith in Jesus Christ. And I looked at all of this and it, the Lord put on my heart. He said, this is nothing new. What America is experiencing, what the world is experiencing is nothing new. There was a time the Lord put this one on my heart. There was a time in Israel's history, the Northern Kingdom, it was a time of prosperity. But the problem was they, they were following Baal. They were following false gods. And so the Lord came and said, you know what? You guys have been following, you've left me. You've been following false gods and you've had this prosperity for a time, but it's gonna end. Elijah came and he said, there's three years of drought. 
there will not be any rain on this land for three years. And this time of prosperity changed to a time of despair, a time of no hope, and no rain for three years. You guys know the story. It's 1 Kings 17 through 19, those chapters. And then what happens? The Lord tells Elijah, all right, go. There's going to be rain. It's time to rain. Let's have a battle with these false prophets. And you guys know what happens on Mount Carmel. There's a battle with the false prophets. And Elijah and the people kill all the false prophets. Elijah prays and rain comes upon the land. And how does the leadership respond to this man of God? How does Jezebel respond to Elijah? I'm gonna kill you tomorrow. I'm killing you. And what does Elijah do after three challenging years, tough years of no rain, tough years of just living on absolutely nothing? Tough year, how does Elijah respond to all of these things that he's seen? He runs away. He runs away. He wants to die, Brother Steve. Just what Brother Steve shared this morning. He runs away. He's ready to quit. He wants to give up. He wants to die. And I want to share with you guys this morning one of the most powerful verses in my life. When I get to these challenging times in life, when I get to these times that I want to quit, the Lord always brings me back to this verse. I'm going to share it with you this morning. It's 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 7. Write it down. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 7. It says this, And the angel of the Lord came again a second time to Elijah and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. The journey. 2020 is too great for you. The challenges of life, they'll overcome you. In your own strength, in your own power, if you try to do it your way, you're going to get to that point of despair and giving up and quitting and wanting to die. It is too great for you. There is only one solution. The angel is sitting there and saying there is only one solution. You have to arise and eat. And the food that this angel was giving was not physical food. He's talking about spiritual food. He says you have to arise and you have to feast on the food that's coming from the Lord. And what is the food that comes from the Lord? The very word of God. Jesus himself. Arise and eat. Arise and feast on the food that has been prepared for you by your heavenly father. Arise and eat the word of God. Live, walk in belief and obedience to what God is doing. Arise and eat. The journey is too great for you if you are not filled with the very Spirit of God. The journey is too great for you. I don't care what the challenge is. The journey is too great without the Spirit of God. And so here, I mean, how did you use this year? We're in the 11th month. How did you use this year? to feast on the Lord. Sometimes I, I look at that and that shames me. How did I use this year to feast on the Lord? Or did I use it <laughs> playing the world's smallest violin for the challenging things that I'm going through? How did I use church? We have to refocus on the Lord. We have to authentically follow him. And what we're going to find as we authentically follow him, that we're not alone in this struggle. We're not alone in this battle. Look at what the Lord tells Elijah just a further, a little bit further. First Kings chapter 19, verse 18. Elijah thought that he was the only one. He thought, I'm the only one. I'm going to die. This is just, I should just, this is terrible. It's just me. Notice what the Lord tells Elijah at the end of that chapter. He says, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. We are not alone. We're part of the body of Christ, and there is an authentic, invisible body of Christ made up of authentic believers that are feasting on the Lord during this time of famine in our country. Not just in our country, but across the world. The Lord wants to encourage you this morning that Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. He's our pioneer. He's the captain of our salvation, and he's leading us on a journey. The Lord, this year is a journey, and it might not be the journey that we wanted, but it's the journey that the Lord has prepared for us. And how are we using this journey to draw near to the one who's leading? I think many of us, we've used this journey and we've, we start getting distracted. We start looking around at all of these things going on. And we, instead of looking at the pioneer that's blazing the trail in front of us, we start focusing on this blade of grass over here. Like, look at this blade of grass, Lord. 
Look at that. What are you going to do? And the Lord's way over there. Like, come on, man. Stay in step with me. Stay in step with the Spirit. We have to have those three things. We have to walk in faith. We have to believe that God is working even in this challenging year. We have to believe that God is working and walk in obedience to what he's calling us to do. We have to walk in hope. We have to hope for the future that God knows what he's doing and has an awesome, amazing plan for us even in this month, these times of challenge that God knows what he's doing. He has a plan and guess where he's taking me? He's taking me to something that is permanent. I'm going to, I am headed for a permanent destination, a destination that will not be shaken, that will not be moved with a king that will never change. I'm headed for heaven. And I have hope that God is preparing that place for me. And then I'm to walk, as Pastor Clay encouraged us a few weeks ago, I am to walk in love, love toward two, God and others. And what does this look like? What does it look like to walk like this in the, when we're going through the midst of a crazy time? What does it look like? Paul is going to encourage us. If you have your Bibles, we're right there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul is going to encourage us with three things. He's going to tell us three things this morning. He says when the world is going crazy, you need the very first thing he's going to tell us. He says when that world is going crazy, you are going to be tempted to turn away from the authentic faith. You have to watch out for false teachers. When the world is growing crazy, false teachers are going to increase, and you better watch out for them. You better watch out. Beware of the false teachers. Open with me, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're right there in verse 3. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, the easiest way to examine and see false teachers is to examine the teaching are they teaching what jesus taught in the new testament are they teaching the very teachings of christ or are they teaching something different if they teach something different even just a little bit it's their false teacher we have to watch out examine the teaching of these teachers and the only way that we will be able to examine the teaching of teachers in this time is if we have a foundation on the very word of God. If you do not have a foundation on God's word, you will not be able to tell if someone's teaching you truth or error. They can say whatever they want to say if you do not have a foundation on God's word, which is why in our morning devotions that Lorena and I have with you guys each and every morning, we're, we're, we're almost a broken record. Spend time in the word of God. Sunday and Tuesday night or Wednesday night or Thursday night, it's not enough. You have to have your own personal relationship, devotional time with the Lord. He's speaking to you each and every day. Are you listening to what the Lord is saying? You have to have a foundation on the Word of God. Why? Because the enemy's deception is he wants to look as close as he can look to the truth in order to deceive you. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as what? An angel of light. Thank you, Bible scholars. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise if his servants, the false teachers, also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The false teachers are there, and they're disguising themselves as servants of righteousness. We have to have a foundation on the Word of God so that we can tell truth from error. We, Because they want the enemy wants to deceive those who have no foundation in the truth. If you have no foundation in the truth when that guy knocks on your door, let me tell you what about, about the Jesus I know. And he starts saying all, or she starts saying all these crazy things. If you have no foundation on the word, it's going to sound great. Because false teachers usually sound great. We have to have a foundation on the word. And then the second thing is, does their teaching lead to godliness? Does their teaching lead to godly living? Or does it promote the, the pride that's in self? Does their teaching lead to godliness? Because, I mean, I've told you guys from day one, right? <laughs> I've told you guys that authentic teaching encourages authentic living. And where does it begin? I've told you time and time again, authentic teaching leads to authentic living. And that begins in the home. If you cannot authentically live for Christ in your home, you're never going to be able to authentically live for Christ amongst the world. It's absolutely impossible. 
And so authentic living beginning in the home, but it also begins with the leaders, that leaders have to be authentically living. Notice, Paul tells us, what do these leaders look like? Verse 4, these leaders are puffed up with conceit and understanding nothing. They have a healthy, uh, unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. Look at these leaders, puffed up with conceit. They're prideful. They understand their true, their true inner thing that's going on on the inside is that they understand nothing. They look for controversy. They look for those places to have disagreements and arguments. Why? So that they can show off their supposed wisdom. And if you don't agree with them, guess what? They're not wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> Have you ever met somebody and had a little discussion with them and no matter what you said or what you did, you were the one that was wrong? They're never open they're never open in their thought. Could I be possibly mistaken about this? Let me go think it through and see what the Lord is showing me. They're never wrong. They think that there's something. They love to argue about the smallest things, these smallest things they want to argue about, and these small things end up just being distractions. They want to argue about the distractions in life. And the result is not godliness. Notice the result, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a mean, means of gain. There's, they promote envy. They want someone else's situation. They want somebody else's gifting. They want somebody else's stuff. There's always envy in their lives. There's dissension. There's this thought that there's a competition going on. There's division. They bring division to the body of Christ. They bring competition into the body of Christ. There's slander. They speak evil of the people around them. And then there's evil suspicions. My daughter is watching this game. What do we call that? It's sus. <laughs> we have another fan in the in the building. All the all, all the older guys. I'm like, what is this? It's sus, dude. I'm like, why are you walking around saying it's sus, dude? That makes no sense to me. And my daughter says it's suspicious. <laughs> I'm like, but that's this evil. Your your you're evil suspicions. You're thinking evil about somebody else. It's suspicious. They're suspicious thinking evil of others. There's constant friction. The church has become a battleground. It's out of a hospital or a classroom. It becomes a battleground. The church should never be a battleground. There's a depraved mind. These leaders have a depraved mind. They have not been made alive. They're deprived of the truth. There is no truth in them. They think that godliness is a means for gain. They don't want Jesus Christ. They might say that they do, but they do not want Jesus Christ. They want stuff. I want stuff. I mean, Paul sits here and says, you've been warned. In the midst of challenging times, these evil teachers are going to be on the rise and you have to watch out for them because you know, as a church of God, you know what the enemy is trying to do. What is the enemy trying to do? John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, steal kill, kill, kill destroy. destroy. You know what the enemy's trying to do? None of us are sitting here saying, I wonder what the enemy's trying to do. In our country right now, I wonder what the enemy is trying to do in the world right now. The enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy right now. That is what the enemy is trying to do. And anything that is furthering that agenda is from the enemy. Period. The enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy right now. And he's having a field day. The enemy is moving. And he's bringing this into the church with false teachers. But what does Jesus want to do? Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and they might have life more abundantly. That's what Jesus wants to do in your life. That's what Jesus wants to do in this country. That's what Jesus wants to do all across this globe is to bring people to an authentic hope in Jesus Christ that they can have life and have it more abundantly. That he can make them alive. But how do we live that abundant life? For those of us that know the Lord in the midst of this, how can we live the abundant life? In the midst of all this craziness going on around us today, how can we do it? And we get to the second thing that Paul wants to tell us. He says, as Christians, there is an attitude that you must have towards life. As Christians, the second point is, as Christians, there is an attitude that you must have towards life. Notice verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. That as we are filled with the Spirit, as we pro pro pursue and proclaim our King Jesus and His kingdom, doing what is right in the sight of God, in the sight of others. 
We're to be content where the Lord has placed us. And what does biblical contentment mean? Because every one of us, I, I found this interesting that I say these words, and when I say we need to be content, people have a different idea of what being content actually means. What does being content actually mean? Phil, when you want to see what these words actually mean, who do we go to? We go to McGee. What does J. Vernon McGee say about being content? He says the word contentment here means we are satisfied with our position in life. J. Vernon McGee says biblical contentment is an absolute satisfaction with where God has placed you in life. This is biblical contentment, to be satisfied with your position in life. I'm going to grab one of these pens. Red. John Stott says this, Chris, Christian contentment also does not depend upon external circumstance. Christian contentment is that we are satisfied with our position in life and our contentment does not depend upon the external circumstance that is going on all around us. That we're able to look at that external circumstance, we're able to look at all of this stuff, we're able to look at this and we're able to say, be I ran out of room. Be content. We write over all of those things, all of those external circumstances in life, and we're going to say, regardless of what I see on the outside, I'm satisfied with where God has me, and I'm not going to be influenced or impacted by these external things going on around me. This is true biblical contentment to be satisfied that we understand we have all that we need in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ he has given us everything that we need for life and godliness and we are perfectly satisfied in him that Jesus is sufficient to meet every need of yours he is sufficient to meet every need of the church he is sufficient to meet every need that we are content in Christ, knowing that he's going to do it. Paul expands on this in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. Have you been brought low? Paul had. He said, I've been brought low. I've learned to be content because the Lord is sufficient for me. I know the secret to abound. Have you ever abounded? Paul said, I've abounded. I've learned the secret when I'm, when I'm abounding, that it's not about me, that I'm content in Christ. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, and this is what it is. I can do all things. He doesn't say, I can do some things. He doesn't say, I can do the easy things. He doesn't say, I can do the hard things. Paul says very clearly, I can do all things through him who gives me strength you can do all things through Christ there's nothing that's impossible through Christ that we have everything we need to live a life of godliness contentment is only biblical contentment is only possible through Jesus Christ it is not possible in your own power this is only possible with the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you church we must get back to the place of knowing that God is in control of the affairs of men. We have to get back to that place of understanding that God is sufficient to meet our needs. We have to get back to that place of contentment that the Lord has us right where he wants us. We have to believe and obey him, walk in faith, knowing that we have all that we need in Christ. And there's a thing, the world will never bring you true contentment. Money, the, the thing that everybody chases after is never going to bring you true contentment. Why? Because it's temporary. Money is temporary. Is, look at what Paul says. He says this, for we brought nothing into the world and we can not take anything out of the world. We can't bring anything in. We didn't bring it with us. And it's not going to leave when we leave. I mean, the, the pharaohs of Egypt thought that they could take it all with them, right? They, they packed their tombs full of gold and all the stuff. Those guys, the Tomb Raiders, got really excited when they found Egyptian tombs because they had all the stuff. Like, I'm rich. One tomb, I'm rich. I've got all the stuff. It didn't go with them to the afterlife. It went to the Tomb Raider that came years later. We didn't bring it with us, and we're not going to take it away. Job says it very clearly in Job chapter 1, verse 21, and we sing this song. This is a song that we sing all the time. 
You've sung this song so many times. It says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We sing it. But are we living it? Anybody can sing a song. Anybody can have some words come out of their mouths. But what do your actions say? It reminds me. I was just thinking about, you know, uh, one of the leaders in government had come up and somebody says, you hate that person. And this leader came back and says, I don't hate that person. I don't hate that person. I do not have a bone of hate in my body. That's, that's what that leader said. And I, I look at that. I said, but why is the question asked? She says that she has no hate in her body. But what do her actions say? Church. People don't, people hear the words you say, but people are watching your actions. When you say, I have hope in Jesus Christ, people look. Do you have hope in Jesus Christ or are you hoping in something else? Do we hope in the Lord or do we hope in something else? I mean, we can't take this stuff with us. If we're singing the song, blessed be the name of the Lord, that he's giving and taking away. And we, he, he gives and takes away. He gives and takes And we're like, yeah. There's many in this body that have been brought low this year. We, and yet we sing the song. But how are we acting? How are we acting? What are our actions saying about what we actually believe? We don't get to take us with it. This stuff will never bring permanent contentment because it's only temporary. You don't get to take it with you. Use it for God's glory now. The Lord's going to meet your needs. He knows what you, look at what it says. What are your needs? Verse 8. But if we have food and clothing with these, we'll be content. Paul says you have two needs in life. Food and clothing. I'm stoked everyone here is dressed and in clothing, so I know that the Lord has met that need in your life. Because if there was an issue there, we would really have to come alongside and encourage and help you with that. And I'm almost positive that every single one of you, you had the ability to have a meal this morning that there was some food in your refrigerator. There are people in the world that don't have that luxury of a refrigerator. They don't even know what that is. There are people in the world that don't know where their next meal is coming from. But the Lord takes care of them. How does the Lord do that? I, man, the Lord is absolutely on. We have two needs, food and clothing. And we live in a country where those needs, the Lord has met those needs above and beyond those needs. We are so blessed. What does Jesus say we're to do when we're blessed? Go read this week, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Matthew 6, 25 through 34, I'll give you a little breakdown of it as you read it this week. Jesus says, don't worry. Stop worrying. Why are you so anxious? Why are you so worried about all these things that are going on? I know what you need. I'm going to take care of your needs. But what should you do? You guys, we sing this song too. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We have a responsibility. Let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let's passionately pursue the Lord and his righteousness and his ways. Let's go for it. Because here's the thing, in these challenging times, I mean, we got those, the third thing is very simple. There are those who know this here. They know it here. And yet they will not follow it with their actions. Paul says very clearly, watch out. He gives us a final warning. He says, watch out. There is a trap. In crazy times, there is a trap of falling into this attitude of desiring money, of desiring the world, of desiring stuff. Watch out. There is a trap that's awaiting you. When you get into crazy times, there's a trap awaiting you instead of having your faith in Jesus Christ to put your faith in stuff. I mean, we see it with a parable, right? Jesus says there was a guy, he built his barn, or he, he, he did his crops and he got a bumper crop, he got all this stuff, and what he said, I'm gonna build bigger barns. I have everything I need, I'm gonna take it easy. I, all this is for me. I'm, it's great. Jesus tells him, watch out. Tonight your life will be required of you. You will stand before me face to face and you're going to give an account of what you did with what I blessed you with. 
Watch out for the trap of stuff. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Watch out when we desire something besides the Lord. We open ourselves up to all kinds of temptation. Paul says that this person that is desiring something besides the Lord has plunged himself or herself. And this idea of plunged is the idea of an individual that is drowning. Have you ever been around somebody that's drowning? Have you ever been out in the ocean and somebody panics? It's a scary thing to be out in the ocean and the buddy that you're out in the ocean with is panicking. I'm drowning. Help me. Happened to me, I was out at a, at a beach, I was out in the water. And somebody said, I'm a, I'm a great swimmer. I said, you gotta be a good swimmer to come out to this beach. You gotta be a good swimmer. He said, I'm a great swimmer. We went out and about a quarter of the way out, he stopped and said, I gotta go back. I, uh, and I realized this guy's about to have a panic attack and he's bigger than me. I said, okay, let's go back. I'm trying to talk calmly to him, let's go back, we're okay. It's fine, we're gonna be fine, it's okay. And he started thrashing around. I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And I realized if I go over there and get into arm's reach of this guy, I'm gonna die. Because a drowning person does one thing in the attempt to live, he puts you under, or she puts you under, in an attempt to stay above the, the water. And the result is both of you die. And I looked at him and I said, lie on your back, turn over, lie on your back, float there for a second. My daughter's right over there, 100 yards away, I'm gonna go swim over there, I'm gonna get her boogie board, I'm gonna bring it back. Went over there, got the boogie board, gave him the boogie board and I pulled him in. He didn't die. I was praying the whole time. Because a drowning person wants to bring you with him or her. It's this idea of plunge. They're not going to go down alone. They want to bring. They want you to agree that the things that they're doing are fine. They want you to agree and come along and join with what the what this passion for pursuing the world. They say, "Come and join me in my pursuit of the world. You're going to find your contentment and you're going to find everything you need. Your satisfaction in the world. Come." Paul says, "Watch out! They're drowning. They've plunged." into the waves, they're drowning and they wanna bring you with them. Watch out, it's a trap. What are these guys doing? Wearsby says this, that this verse, it describes a person who has to have more and more material things in order to be happy and feel successful, but riches are a trap. They lead into bondage, not freedom. Instead of giving satisfaction, riches create additional lusts and desires, and these must be satisfied. And what happens as we attempt to satisfy the desires of the world? What happens? Paul tells you, verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. When we pursue the world, we turn our back on the Lord. We can't pursue both God and the world. It's impossible. When we pursue the world, we turn our back on the Lord. We wander away from the Lord and the end for us is that we're gonna end empty. We trade the eternal for the temporary. Let me give you two examples. I'll give you an Old Testament example, and I'll give you a New Testament example of somebody who turned away from the Lord and pursued the world. The Old Testament example would be Achan. You guys remember Achan? Joshua chapter 7, verse 21. What does it say about Achan? He says, I saw the goods of the world. And when I saw it with my eyes, what did I do? I coveted it with my heart. And when I see something with my eyes and I covet it with my heart, what ends up happening? I reach out with my action and I take it. I saw, I coveted, I took. This is what Achan did. It's an example of turning away from the Lord. He had everything that he needed in Christ. And yet when he saw the goods of the world, when he saw what the world had to offer, he turned away from the Lord. He saw it, he coveted it, and he took it. He went after the world. And what was the end result for Achan? Death. And that drowning man did not only, did not go to death alone. He took his whole family with him. And many times that's what happens because our kids start to see our attitudes and our actions towards the things of the world and they start to see that's okay for a Christian to do, to desire the things of the world. And they end up going after, and it just brings shipwreck and death. The New Testament, Demas, 
We're going to talk about him more as we get into 2 Timothy in a couple of months. But what does it say? It says that Demas, he was a servant. He was a friend. He served alongside the Apostle Paul. And then at the end of Paul's life, he says this, this is Demas' testimony. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, that he loved the present world. He turned away from the Lord. He loved the present world. He went out from serving the Lord. He chased after the dream of the world. Ends in shipwreck and destruction. He's, there he is in the Bible. We see him through the Bible serving the Lord, and all of a sudden, he ends up following the world. John, the apostle, the great apostle John, reminds us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. The world is temporary. It will never satisfy. It will never bring contentment because it's passing away. But whoever does the will of God, abides forever Amen. guys we have to be about the father's business i don't want to end up empty i want to be able to look back on the year of 2020 and write those words i am content with what the lord has done in 2020 he's given me food he's given me shelter he's given me clothes i'm a blessed man i want to share the hope that i have in jesus christ with others because I, I don't care who you vote for. I, anyways, you're voting for somebody on Tuesday, or you already went and voted. Neither one of those guys is our savior. Both of those people will fail, period. Both of them. If we look for our satisfaction and our life in who either of those two candidates, we're gonna be sorely disappointed. Because the only one that will provide lasting contentment is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, we have to get back to this place where we say, I am going to be content where Christ has me and with what Christ is doing in the world around me. I am going to be content. MacArthur ended with this, and I really love this quote. He says, who's the richest person in the world? Who? Who is the richest person in the world? It is a trick question. Because I thought, Bill Gates. Is it? No. no? Zuckerberg? Zuckerberg is no. What about the Bezos guy? They're, who's the richest person in the world? You name all these. There's billion, million, and trillionaires. MacArthur says you're wrong because every one of those people wants something. Every single one of those people still has a desire that has been unfulfilled. They don't have enough. They're not rich because there's something that they want. MacArthur says this, the richest person is the one who is content in Christ and does not need anything else. Amen. That is, did you hear that church? The richest person in the world today is the one who is content in Christ and doesn't need anything else. Does that describe Eli? Oh, man. Or do I need something else to be content? Examine our hearts, guys. We have an election in two days, promise of more unrest. We have an election with this challenge that's facing our nation. And in the midst of all of this 2020, in the midst of the craziness of life, let's choose. You have to make it, I can't make a choice for you. You have to make a choice. I am going to rest and be content in Christ. I'm gonna trust and have faith in his plan. I am going to hope, I'm gonna walk in hope in his future that he has promised to me. I'm going to hope in the promises of God. I am going to love God and love others as I am filled with the Spirit. I'm going to walk in love towards the people around me. I'm going to live as an authentic Christian focused on Jesus and what he did on the cross. And that's what we are going to do as we end this, this morning. We have 15 minutes. I'm going to do two things as we end this morning. Church, the first thing that we must do is we need to focus back on Jesus and what he has done for us. We are going to take communion this morning because we were all separated from Christ. We were all sinners. We were all dead. But God, being rich in mercy with his great love that he's had towards us, what we were dead in our trespasses and sins made us alive in Jesus Christ. But God did something. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and he didn't stay dead. He took my place. And he proclaimed power over death. He proclaimed power over sin by rising again three days later. 
If you don't have a foundation on Jesus Christ, the Lord is calling you this morning. Believe in him. Because he's the only one that can offer you hope for the future. It's so simple. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please, Lord, be master of my life. Jehovah, you are Lord God. And I'll follow you wherever you're going to go. You are Lord. We're going to have communion. We're going to look back on the cross. We're going to look back on what Christ did for us. We're going to take, we're going to take the next five minutes and we're going to meditate and thank the Lord that he is God. We're going to thank the Lord for what he did for us on the cross. We are going to thank the Lord together. Meditate. And I want you to, as you thank the Lord, can you just think as you thank the Lord this morning? How has God been good to you? There are many of you today and watching online who are having a challenging year. You're going through a rough time as Steve, Pastor Steve, talked to us about. You want to give up hope. to this year that you can say God has been good to me what is it and as you as you sit there and meditate would you just thank the Lord would you thank the Lord as we pass out the elements as we sing this song focus in on Jesus Christ and thank the Lord for what he has done for you you guys can pass ushers you can pass out the elements Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father God, we do thank you for your body. Lord, as we have meditated and we remember our great need for you this morning. Lord, we look on your body that was broken for us, that you took our place, you took our punishment on the cross. Lord, we can't thank you enough for what you did for us. Lord, if there's sin in our life this morning, we, we come humbly before you, repenting and asking you to forgive we talked about in our devotional time this week, Lord, we, we want those refreshing, those refreshing times to come from the presence of the Lord. Lord, would you blot out our sin? Lord, forgive us for those times maybe when we've misrepresented you and your kingdom. Lord, forgive our country. We pray as Daniel would pray, Lord, forgive our nation for turning our backs on you. Lord, help us to be like in the times of Elijah, the 7,000 that will not kiss the false idols, that will not bow down to the false idols that the enemy offers us in the world. Lord, you are our God, you are our King, and you humbled yourself and died for us, and we thank you. We thank you for your body that was given for me on the cross. In Jesus' name, you guys can take the bread together. Paul continues and says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Lord, we proclaim here on this property that you died for sinful men. You died for sinful women. Lord, you died for us. Lord, you died. You loved the world. You gave your son, Lord for us. And we can't thank you enough. Lord, we want to proclaim your great name, Lord, and we proclaim that there is a day that you have said that you are coming again and you are going to take us to yourself, that where you are, there we may be also. And we proclaim, Lord, that we will be in your presence and that we will be with our loved ones who have believed in you and who have gone before. Lord, what a joyous day that will be. We anticipate and hope in your promises because your promises are yes and amen. amen. 
<sighs> so Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us. The blood and water as, you, as the spear pierced your side, that you gave your life there on the cross. We thank you for the payment for my sin. Lord, help me to be the ambassador that you've called me to be to proclaim your name until you come. And so, Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can take the cup together. And church, I want to encourage you. We have three minutes. I want to encourage you. Christ isn't done yet. Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's not done yet. I want to spend, we're going to, we got, do we have a last song, Jim? We did, good. I want to spend two minutes of our three minutes. We did it last two weeks ago with Pastor Clay. We have an election in two days. Can you just, in your seats right now, can you pray two minutes? I'd love it if you prayed out loud, if, you, if you're too shame. Okay. Pray out loud right where you are in your seat. Would you pray that the Lord would have mercy on our nation? Would you pray, would you pray as Daniel prayed, forgiveness for us? Because we, whether we want to admit it or not, we are sinful people. We are sinners. We are sinners saved by grace, but there's a whole world out there that's just lost in their sin. Would you pray, would you spend the next two minutes just out loud where you're at and pray for this upcoming election that the Lord's will be done and that we, his church, would live authentically as we move into whatever the future is going to hold. I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I know the guy who does. His name is God. His name is Jesus. And he's not surprised by what's going to happen on Tuesday. His plan isn't going to be derailed by what whatever happens on Tuesday. His plan is going to go forward. And I want to keep in step with his plan. And so would you just join me for two minutes. Pray out loud where you're at. And then, uh, Jim, when we're done, if you got, if you just want to start the song, and we'll, we'll close in a song. Father God, Lord, would you do a work, God, in our country? Lord, we want to just spend this few moments of time. Lord, as we gather as your church, would you do a work in the United States of America? Lord, we pray for this election coming up in two days, God, that your will will be done, that you are not surprised, that you know the future, that you stand outside of time and are able to understand everything that happens within time that you've created. Lord, would you do a work in the United States of America? Would you show us mercy and grace here on, uh, on the election day on Tuesday? Lord, would you do continue that work? We want to trust in you that your will will be done in the United States as well as across the world. Lord, I pray for your church that we could be the body of Christ, that we could be the hands and feet that are going to be ministering to those who absolutely are going to need to hear of Jesus Christ. Lord, come to they need to hear of you today. And so, Lord, would you do that work? Would you use us as your body? Would you do that work in us? Would you do that work through us? Would you fill us fresh with your spirit, giving us your mind, the mind of Christ, as we navigate through these uncertain times? Lord, would we have that contentment as we rest in you? Lord, would you, man, we want to look to you, because you're going to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. And so, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us fresh. Give us the ability, Lord, to follow you on the days of our lives. And so we love you, Lord. We're going to commit ourselves to you. We want to see you. We're excited to see the things that you're going to do in us and through us. So, Lord, go before. Lord, be our rear guard. Be the pioneer, the captain of our souls, the captain of salvation. And so we thank you for these things. We pray in Jesus' name. out again like we came in. The God is able to do all things abundantly above all that we ask or even think. And the closest place the word Yahweh is not necessarily in the New Testament, but in Revelation they're singing hallelujah, which is praise Yahweh, the all-sufficient one. So as we go out, Again, let's just meditate on that and sing with our all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, just declaring praise to the Lord.